I'm lost all the time, so I went on a labyrinth vacation. The dizzying joys of maze tourism in Barcelona, Paris and Chinanso. Who's to say when exactly we started to walk twisting paths to think of them as sites for enjoyment, for the holy, and for the surreal? Labyrinths and mazes have appeared across cultures and time, made by digging ruts into the soil, laying out rock or mosaic or enclosing paths within hedges, walls, bamboo, corn and mirrors. The first recorded labyrinth dates to the 19th century BC, built by Egyptians near the ancient city Arsinoe to hold the sepulture of kings and crocodiles. In the desert of Peru, the Nazca dug winding geoglyphs in the shape of birds, flora and monkeys. Some of them were thought to be traversed by gods and spirits, by priests and pilgrims during ceremonies. Rock-lined labyrinths along the coasts of the Baltic Sea may have been created in the Bronze Age. Surviving lore suggests they were used in spring pagan dances and light exorcisms, trapping malevolent spirits in their confounding geometry. And of course, one of the most enduring myths of ancient Greece is that of the Minotaur lying in wait at the center of the maze. We don't all seek the same things in these winding pathways. People may use the worlds of a labyrinth, universal constructions that wind to the center, to enter an exalted, spiritual state. Take, for example, the pilgrims who have flocked to the church labyrinth at Chartres Cathedral in France for a thousand years. Mazes, which, unlike labyrinths, fort and multiply and often led to dead ends, error gardens, the Germans call them, offer a touch more hedonism, drawing tourists from all over for their beauty. The oldest surviving hedge maze, planted in 1690 for King William I.E. in Hampton Court Palace, gets around 330,000 visitors per year. I come to mazes and labyrinths for a different reason. In them, I can be a student of my own bewilderment. Every day since 2007, after an accident and brain injury that gave me temporary amnesia, I have been lost. I am never quite sure where I am. I first realized this cognitive change one day as I was behind the wheel, going around the block. Making four turns was something I had accomplished a million times before, but now, after the first turn and arriving at the next block, I was perplexed. Where had I come from? Did I now turn right or left? My husband was worried. He said we should take me to the doctor. We never did. I can't say why, but somehow it didn't feel like an emergency, plus we were both uninsured. Being lost simply became a way of life. I did okay when moving in a straight line. But the second I turned right or left, that mental image tracking my own movements in relationship to my surroundings disappeared. With no point of reference, I journeyed in circles, walked by the same storefront over and over again, stared in wonder at bus stop maps detailing information I could no longer read. Is it strange that I enjoyed this? I thought my life was beautiful, ruled as it was by astonishment. It felt like a miracle when I reached my destination. After being lost for 16 years, a day came when I craved being lost on purpose. I fantasized about meandering in some of the world's most ancient mazes in search of designs meant to invent and enhance my confusion, where I could finally escape the pressure to find and be found. Outside the castle of Chinanso, in Chinanso, France, is one of the most dazzling mazes in Europe. Of course, I lose my way getting there. At the train station in Paris, a tall man calls out to inform me that I am looking at arrivals and not departures. Luckily, we are going to the same train, and in the most French turn of events ever, the man, Mark, reveals he is a hot air balloon pilot while making me coffee out of his bed. Is he ever lost? Mark says the only time he's lost is when he's high up in the air. I don't especially know what he means until later, when we exchange information and are chatting online, and he sends me a photo of the balloon above the cloud cover. Diane de Poitiers lived at the castle, as did Catherine de Medici. De Medici, in fact, evicted Poitiers, a mistress of her husband, King Henry, once he died. I am against the hoarding of this much wealth, but I feel for Diane de Poitiers, whose room is lovely, with a velvety sky blue four-poster bed and a wall-to-wall -wall tapestry depicting, among other things, a bonneted woman stabbing a stake into a sleeping man's temple and later holding his severed head over a basin. The castle is built over the water, part of it atop a bridge that spans the river Cher, whose series of gothic arches double in the water. Ample gardens, designed first by Poitiers and then de Medici, feature box hedges, diagonal paths, flower beds, urns, fountains and yew trees. Continue reading the main story. 
the mazes a bit away from the property, built centuries after de Medici's death. I have never been to a hedge maze before, and as I follow the signs through warming sunlight and a trilling forest, I am dumbstruck. Two thousand yew trees make up its winding paths. It is early still, and quiet, and the needles of the yew trees are silver with frost. No one else is here. Everyone has gone to see the castle. The ground crunches underfoot, and I make my first choice between two paths as if I were stealing away with treasure. Having come unprepared for the French winter, I am wearing all my clothes one over the other. The tops of the hedges are razor sharp and curved this way and that, fitting into one another like a puzzle. They are up to my chin. At the center, I can see the elevated wooden platform of a Gloriat. I wonder if I will grow desperate to escape, and if I am above throwing myself over the hedges to do so. I am not. The question is how long until I do. I turn around, and the path splits into four. I have been here before. I am a child of the 90s, raised on Jim Henson's labyrinth so dutifully, I make a mark on the ground. I walk through jolts of light, caress the needles of the use I know to be highly poisonous if consumed, and somehow, when I look up, I have made it to the middle. Impressive. From the raised platform, I see four caryatids directly across the maze from the winged lion statues guarding its entrance. I think I am advancing in a way that will let out, but instead I arrive, over and over and over again, to the Gloriat. I tongue my cheek in frustration. Beneath that my pleasure is immense. A line that is traversed repeatedly until it becomes a path is called a desire line. To be confounded by desire, then, is happiness of the highest order. Navigating space is a voyage at sea. A friendly ship appears. Vous avez besoin de aid. A woman calls. Non, Mergy. I call back. Ah, Murdy. I hear the same woman exclaim, as she comes to a dead end. She is the top of a black wool hat, blue eyes, ambling along. Suddenly I think I see where the hedges part, where the woman is now joyously exiting. I hurry in a line to the spot. When I exit, I double over, hooting beneath the caryatids, which I now see are pockmarked by time, faces and hands missing, but I smile up at the one white giant, holding a club, wearing what looks like a cloak with a lion head attached. A different sort of maze exists underneath the city of Paris. Most of it is closed to the public, but that doesn't stop lovers of the labyrinthine from sneaking in. I meet L.O. Cavernicol there, 65 feet below ground in the Parisian catacombs. She is a cataphile, an urban explorer entranced by the secret catacombs, a network of subterranean ancient stone quarries, tunnels and galleries that sprawl for more than 170 miles in a sort of negative of the city above. No high-minded noble woman inspired this place. The catacombs were born in the 18th century, when some of the abandoned limestone quarries began to weaken and parts of the city caved in. Overflowing cemeteries meant the bones of Parisians, some of them 1,200 years old, had to be relocated. As officials dug tunnels to connect the quarries and reinforce them, and to give a resting place to the dead, they created, inadvertently, a maze. There are only a few areas of the catacombs accessible to the public. Among them is the ossuary where six million Parisians find their resting place. The entrance is in Montparnasse, 131 steps down a spiral staircase. At each revolution, the sound of the city recedes. We are standing by a shadowy recess branching from the tunnel that is closed off by a locked gate when we hear a tinny knock. It seems to come from above ground. L.O. smiles. That's the sound of someone stepping on the manhole cover above. L.O. is just a nickname. Cataphils never use their real names, L.O. tells me. Venturing into the secret catacombs is illegal, and cataphils are always hiding from catoflic, catacomb police. The world of cataphils is populated with other words. Cataclysts are those who pollute the space. Cataclysms are the efforts of cataphils to restore and clean the space. There are parties, too. Cat Halloween, Cat Carnival. L.O. has cataphile friends from all walks of life. There's a guy working for the minister, we have policemen friends. Any kind of people, firefighters, lawyers. This is nice. L.O. exudes a breezy cool. Both sides of her head are shaved. She has baby bangs and a spike pierces her chin and ends in a silver point. She tells me she once stayed underground, about a mile from where we are, in the secret catacombs for ten days. She lodged as a good friend coked, drank beer, made jokes. She built a bench out of limestone rocks. When you make a sound there she says it has nowhere to go. 
the noises coming from her person bounced against the walls of the tunnels and returned as if coming from somewhere else. It seemed as if her own footsteps didn't belong to her and someone was walking just behind. The tunnel then forked into four different directions. Elo lost all sense of where she was, including where she had just come from.